Island AFL-CIO, and I will be your MC today. I want to thank you all for coming here today on such a beautiful day. No, yeah, I'm not. Dedicating your time to the... Uh, a little louder here? Okay, all right, got to be a little louder. We're going to start with the Director of Operations for the Big Brother and Big Sisters, Jen McCawson, who's going to join us or lead us in singing the National Anthem. Jen? number of people who have joined us here today from the political world, and this is in no order because I scribbled it on this thing, so uh, don't take offense uh, if you're out of order or some official order. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, Congressman yeah. yeah. David Cicilline, yeah. yeah. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, yeah. our next Secretary of State, Greg Amore. Today, George, no, 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 he, no, he's speaking. I, I tell you, we've got a lot of people to make sure you're not screwing up here. Uh, our first speaker today is no stranger to all of us. He is our present governor, Governor Dan McKee, who will be our next governor. Yes. an event like this today to join us uh, in this rally for big brothers and big sisters and it's also a political rally and that's a surprise to see who that's going to be for. So, <laughs> Dan McKee, part of his whole career has been dealing with young people and providing opportunities. One of the first things he did in his career is set up the Boys and Girls Club in Cumberland. In fact, it was just the boys club and he made sure that the girls were taken care of so it became the girls and boys club. So he has a real commitment and compassion to young people, the types of individuals who are served by big brothers and big sisters. He came into the office, has done a remarkable job, got the state going in the right direction and as he has told many, many audiences, his number one priority is J-O-B-S, because that solves a lot of problems. So with that, we welcome Governor McKee. Rhode Island's time. 
time, right to, right now, we're going to take it and to have Secretary Marty Walsh here today. Such an unbelievable experience. Not only are we meeting within the state, but we're also bringing people in from uh, Washington with our congressional delegation and our secretaries that are showing the caring about our state of Rhode Island and the people who live in Rhode Island and the people who work in Rhode Island. And we know that the J-O-B-S is our number one priority and we're going to make it happen. Yes. But we need your help to make that happen. I can tell you right now that I'm involved in a campaign that I never thought I would see in the state of Rhode Island. We got a MAGA denier running for, for governor in the state of Rhode Island. We got somebody who doesn't care about J-O-B-S. In fact, she worked for a governor in Illinois that was advocating right to work in that state. We need to build up the enthusiasm right now in the next couple weeks because what is at stake? The work that we have done in the state over the last 20 months has shown us we have momentum like we've never seen before and we need to keep it. And the way we keep it is create a big margin of victory for each and every one of our general officers on the ballot today. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to tell you about the projects that we have in the pipeline that are going to address the issue of jobs and an economic recovery today that Rhode Island is leading the Northeast, second in the country, on an economic recovery. We have the lowest unemployment rate that we have ever seen, and yet there's still good paying jobs available. And we're gonna fill those jobs. And the way that we're gonna fill those jobs, with the help of the Speaker and the Senate President and the General Assembly, we're going to invest in our communities and the people who live in our communities. We're going to do that project in Pawtucket. We're not going to turn our back on Pawtucket. We're going to do that project. We're going to, we're going to invest in Narragansett and the fisheries. 40 million bucks. And we're going to put people to work. We're going to invest in East Providence. And we're going to build a seaport for the offshore wind. And that's yeah, going to get done. Yeah. We need a little help. We're going to need a little help from our congressional delegation, Senator, but we're going to make that happen. Yeah. We're going to continue invest in our communities like Johnston right now. Yeah. Big project, biggest project really in the history of, of the Amazon. Of a prevailing yeah. wage. Yeah. Prevailing wage. First time yeah. ever. Uh, in the country. Yeah. 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 In Woonsocket, in Providence, we're going to turn the lights on the Superman building. And for me, we're even going to put a roof on the dunk, now the amp, so when I go see a basketball game, I'm not going to have to worry about a leaking roof. I'm not going to enjoy the game. The way that we're going to do it, is we're going to provide good paying jobs. We hear about a recession that might be coming. The best defense against an economic downturn, and by the way, Rhode Island is no longer that state that's going to be first in and last out of economic downturns. It is not going to happen again. And the way we're going to do it, the best defense about an economic downturn is J-O-B-S. And we're going to make that happen. In order to make that happen, we need to make sure that we win on every level. Not just the state level, but the national level. And I can tell you right now, we're so happy to have Secretary Walsh here. We've had more visits 
the secretaries in the cabinet in the state of Rhode Island in the last 20 months than I have seen in my lifetime. We have a friend in the White House. First Lady Biden will be in Rhode Island next week. And what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about education. We're going to talk about teacher pipelines. We are going to create more and more jobs with the investments that we're going to make. But we need to make sure we hold on to Congress. Yes. We need to make sure that's a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate. And we need to keep President Biden with the support he needs to give the people in the state of Rhode Island the help that we deserve. So we're here not only about the state general offices. We're here about holding on to all four seats, our two congressional seats, our two Senate seats. Long term, we need to elect Seth Magazina in District 2. For us to hold on to the momentum in the state of Rhode Island, we need our General Assembly on board. We need the governor's office on board. We need our municipal leaders on board where they all showed up this week to support my candidacy against an unknown candidate who showed up in the state of Rhode Island for the money and then paid herself more in a week than the average citizen makes in a year. And when that money ran out because she mismanaged the contract on COVID, she registered to vote for the first time in the state of Rhode Island. And then she declared that she was going to run for governor because she thinks that she knows better than us. Let's send her back. She has not even unpacked her bags yet. <laughs> but for us to do the whole thing to keep the momentum going in the state of Rhode Island we need to elect our state leaders and our congressional delegation and our congressional delegation my last few words here is thank you so much Senator White House thank you Senator Reed. Thank you, Congressman Langevin. Thank you, Congressman Cicilline. All the things that are happening in the state of Rhode Island, they've had a hand in that. And their leadership before the pandemic and during the pandemic has been extraordinary. And we want to keep that going. We're not going to keep that going by sending a Republican from District 2 to Washington. We're going to keep that going by making sure we have a clean sweep. And let's make sure we make it happen for each and every one of us. In particular right now, the one that is most important is to get behind Seth Magazina and get him elected in, in, in Congress District 2. Send him to Washington. Let's keep this momentum going. Thank you so much for being here this morning. introduce uh, our next speaker, I want to acknowledge that uh, the, sec the uh, Speaker of the House, Joseph Taxi, is with us, and the Senate Thank you very much. This is, uh, at this time, I'd like to call up uh, our senior U.S. Senator, Jack Reed, who will be doing an introduction. Uh, Jack is no stranger to us, tremendous labor supporter, tremendous supporter for the state of Rhode Island in a very prestigious position now. As the governor said, we're going to keep the Senate and keep the House so we can keep Jack Reed in the positions that he can help Rhode Island the most. Senator Reed, thank you. Thanks, George. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. I want to first salute the building for AIDS. Not only do you... Yeah! Not only do you... 
not only do you keep Rhode Island moving forward, but you also don't forget other people, like big brothers and sisters. And today, thank you for your kindness, your charity, your consideration. And to Kathy Alfonseca and all the big brothers and sisters, uh, good luck, good work, and thank you for keeping it up. Uh, we're here to support every Democrat. But I particularly want to emphasize what the governor said. If we cannot elect Seth Magaziner to the second district and we allow the Republicans to take over, all of what we've achieved in the last two years is in jeopardy. Reducing drug costs for seniors, providing a transition to alternate energy, which will provide thousands of jobs here in Rhode Island in terms of offshore wind, in terms of many different things. We have got to do that because the McCarthy Republicans, the Jim Jordans, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, when they take over, it's not going to be good for working men and women in this country. Uh, it's not going to be good for anyone in this country. So we've got to get behind Seth and make sure that he crosses that finish so line at least lower in a few so weeks. Shoot? Now, I have a great privilege, and that great privilege is introduce Marty Walsh. Now, Marty is the story of America, and the story of the power of organized labor to provide opportunity so that individuals can fulfill the American dream, can use their talent and their skills to build a better life for themselves, for the children, for their community, and for this nation. Marty's parents came from Ireland, and they settled in Dorchester, a working class neighborhood. And Marty has worked all of his life. At 21, he joined the laborers union. And then he worked his way up to be head of the Boston Building Trades. He served as a state representative because one of the good things about the labor union is it's not just all about me, it's also what can I do to help my community? And Marty's done that. As mayor of Boston, he set a standard of integrity, of excellence, of commitment to working people, of making sure that the city responded to the needs of all its people. And that record he carries on today. A fighter for working men and women, he is someone that I'm so proud to call a friend, so proud to ask him to come forward and say a few words. Marty Wolf! Thank you, Senator, and it's, uh, it's an honor to, to, to work with you and, and, and and watch you and, and, and the great work that you're doing. It's great to be here today. Uh, as I was thinking, I was listening to the governor talk, and I was thinking about what do you say. Uh, first of all, we have a great organization uh, that we're here supporting, and I want to thank them for their amazing work. And, you know, the senator talked a little bit about my upbringing. And when you think about, when I think back to growing up, I grew up <clears throat> right up 95 to 93 to Dorchester. That's where I <clears throat> excuse me, grew up. And I grew up in a house, a kitchen, that my father was a laborer. He came from Ireland and he was able to join the Labor's Union in 1956. My Uncle Pat came to New York first, then came, joined the Labor's Union. And at our kitchen table, uh, what was discussed when I was a little kid in the 70s was work. And back then there wasn't a lot of work around. And back then, people would have to take a layoff so somebody else could get a job so they get their health care. Or maybe take a layoff so somebody else could get their pension hours. And a lot of the old timers, the retirees that he had to, you know what I'm talking about. It was a brotherhood and a sisterhood where you support each other. And that's the house I grew up in. And everything that I have in my life, all the different positions I've had, everything I've had, has come out of the labor movement. It's been about the labor movement. It's about what the Democratic Party stands for. And we have a president right now who's a Democrat. But if you look at what he's done, it's about how do we, how do we promote and how do we push ahead the middle class? How do we create an opportunity for poor people to get into the middle class? The president talks about building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. He's not talking about trickle-down economy, because that didn't work. We all heard about trickle-down economy, how 
you know, everyone's going to make money. And I have no, nothing against anyone making money. But that doesn't always filter down. And what happens is how do we build from the, the bottom up and the middle out? And that's what we've seen with this administration. That's what we've seen with this president. If you look at the policies that your congressional delegation, your Senate delegation has fought for, starting with the American Rescue Plan, when President Biden took office, 10 million people were out of work. Our schools were closed. Our businesses were closed. Businesses were going bankrupt. The American Rescue Plan was able to keep those businesses open, was able to get people back to work, investment in, in getting vaccines in people's arms. Follow that up with the infrastructure legislation. Think about the infrastructure legislation, what that's going to do for America. All of our roads and bridges and broadband access and all of the things that are happening. The president's agenda. Following that up with the CHIPS bill. The CHIPS bill. The CHIPS bill is going to allow us the opportunity to not talk about bringing American manufacturing back to the United States of America, but actually doing it in that bill. We see it right now in Ohio, where <coughs> Intel just broke ground on a $20 billion project to, to build microchips that we invented in the United States of America. That wouldn't have happened. The, by the way, that bill passed with only Democratic votes. It was, so there's no one on the other side that says we should bring American manufacturing back to America and building our manufacturing. The IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, a bill that's going to bring down costs on our seniors. It's going to cap prescription drug costs for our seniors. How long have we been talking about that? We've been talking about it forever. It's going to cap what a family pays for, for insulin to $35. Not every family in America is impacted with, with children and with people with, with, with diabetes. But there's a lot. There are people here today. It's going to cap that. That bill passed with only Democratic votes. The president in this administration and the Democrats in the Senate and the House took on Big Pharma. For the first time, Big Pharma didn't win. And again, there's nothing wrong with them making money, but they don't have to take abuse of their average working people every single day. That's right. That doesn't need to happen. <laughs> this administration and this president has protected our veterans. This administration, this president has impacted our kids. America is moving forward. And then we hear attacks from the MAGA Republicans talking about taking Social Security away. Think about that for a minute. Social Security. We pay Social Security. You pay into Social Security. And we're going to take away Social Security. We want to turn around our health care policies in the United States of America. What type of country do we want to be? Do we want to be a country that takes away benefits from working class people and poor people and keeping them down? Or do we want to be a country that supports people to create that opportunity to get into the middle class? When I was running for mayor of Boston, I got criticized off an awful lot about being a union person, a union guy saying that I couldn't run a city, I, I'd be dis, I wouldn't be the right guy, I couldn't run a budget, I couldn't balance a budget. What we did in Boston as a union guy, first of all, I wore it as a badge of honor, but all we did in Boston in seven years was, was have a AAA bond rating seven consecutive years with our budget, first time that's ever happened. We created 140,000 new jobs, we, we added $48 billion in new development, we paved streets, we brought in bike lanes, we, we tackled climate change, we did all of those things that are important. That's what we did. As a union guy, that's what I did. And I'm proud that I'm a union guy, and you should be proud that you're union people in this chat. You should hold that with a badge of honor. There is a lot, there is a lot at stake in November. There's a lot at stake for the future of our country. When you look back on these last two years of, of of President Biden and what the uh, Democrats have been able to accomplish in the United States Congress. When you look at those, look at the legislation alone. Look at the people that have been impacted and will be impacted for, for the next decade. When you talk about and think about where we want to go as a country, you heard the governor here talk about the projects that he wants to move forward with. And then with the with all of the, the revenue and the, and the investments that are coming down, what you can do here in Rhode Island with the federal investments that are being made in our country. Think about the growth that can happen in Rhode Island. Think about the growth that can happen in Massachusetts. Think about the growth that can happen in New England. It's important. I take you back to my kitchen table as a little kid. 
when I was a little kid, my father used to take me to political rallies. I'd hold a sign. And I was little, I just held the sign. I loved it from the beginning. As I got older, I did the lit drops, and I did the phone banks, and I did the door knocking, and I did all that. And quite honestly, I did that right up pretty much until even when I was there, I did some of that. It's important. There's a lot at stake in our country as we move forward here. You have an incredible delegation here in Rhode Island. Many of them are my friends. I've known them for a long time. You have an incredible opportunity. We have an incredible opportunity in this country as we move forward. It's important as we go out over the next couple of weeks to think about what's at stake. And what's at stake in our country is that opportunity to build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. The reality of the situation is that. And usually you hear people talk about, you know, it's the most important election of our lifetime. And this is obviously important. Every election is important because it sets the policy. But this election, this election that's coming up now, is really about thinking about what, what has been happening and the great things that have been happening coming out of Washington, D.C., getting our economy back up and running. We've had a very, very, very challenging three years. Two, year, two and a half years ago, when I was sitting in my office in City Hall in Boston, I never imagined the week before this happened that I'd be shutting down our businesses and our schools and our colleges. Hospitals wouldn't be, wouldn't be taking elective procedures. I wasn't thinking there'd be no one on the streets. I was hoping about a bustling economy. And back then when that happened, we didn't have a plan. There was no federal plan. There was no plan. What we had to do was make up our own plan as we move forward. We can't let that happen again. There's a plan in the United States of America right now, and that's an important plan. And many of your senators and congressmen and governors and everyone else that's behind me today and the AFL-CIO and the unions, they understand what that plan is. That plan is about creating a pathway, a pathway, an opportunity for a family to get into the middle class, whether that family is a fifth generation Rhode Island family, or whether that family is somebody who just came off a plane and walked into a neighborhood and is raising their family, like my parents did that came to this country as immigrants. And this, this country gave my immigrant family an opportunity to become part of the middle class. And this, that opportunity presented my family with an opportunity to be standing here with you today. So ladies and gentlemen, there's two weeks left. There's two weeks left. And all I ask you to do is think back what's happened in the last two years and ask, are we in a better place today yes. than we were two years before that? Yes. Or are we in a worse place? That's the answer. And I have the honor now to bring up the next speaker to this microphone, um, a gentleman who I've known for a while, a friend, somebody who, is, who has done the, in some ways, I, I guess I shouldn't call it the ultimate sacrifice, putting your name on the ballot, regardless of who you are, is challenging. And that's sometimes, somebody puts their name on the ballot and they're against what we think about, but they still take the time to put their name on the ballot because they care about the opportunities in front of them. And it's really challenging. And it's challenging because it disrupts your whole family, it disrupts your whole life, it disrupts a lot because there's all kinds of sides everywhere. And this young man decided to do that. So I want to bring to the microphone Seth Magaziner, who's coming to the microphone. Now. delegation, Jack Reed, Sheldon Whitehouse, David Cicilline, and Jim Langevin, who are always fighting for Rhode Island. Thank you very much. <laughs> to our governor, to our governor who gets it and who understands that the path to opportunity for Rhode Islanders is more jobs. We have to re-elect Governor McKee and Democrats up and down the ticket. And to Secretary Walsh who is the very embodiment of the American dream and what we all fight for as Democrats and as Americans. Thank you for your hard work. <laughs> Most importantly, to the working men and women who are here today, thank you for building up our state. 
You build our buildings. You take care of our sick and our elderly. You teach our kids. You are the reason that Rhode Island is a great place to live. And we thank you for what you do every day. Now, my family story starts with my grandparents. They were all the children of immigrants. My grandfather, Bob, was the son of Irish immigrants in Worcester, Massachusetts. My grandfather, Lewis, was the son of Jewish immigrants in New York City. They didn't have a lot of education. When they came back home from the war, they got jobs that were not glamorous jobs. Bob in Worcester was a union steel worker at a company that made airplane parts. Lewis in New York was a bookkeeper for a company that canned tomatoes. But here's the point. With those jobs, they were able to buy houses. They were able to put all their kids through school. They were able to earn a ticket to the middle class. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Over the last generation, though, it's gotten harder. What I hear from Rhode Islanders is people are working harder and harder, but they're not keeping up with their bills. People are getting gouged by the gas companies, by the prescription drug companies, by the health insurance companies. How's a working person supposed to get ahead today? The answer is we need leaders in Washington who are prepared to fight for working people, not for the corporate special interests. Yeah. The big oil companies are making billions of dollars of profits while they overcharge working people. The drug companies are making billions of dollars of profits while they overcharge working people. The health insurance companies, billions of dollars while they overcharge people for health care. How do they get away with it? It's because they know that there are a lot of politicians that they have in their pockets. They give them campaign money. My opponent is one of them. Millions of dollars from the oil companies and the drug companies are going into Alan Fung's campaign. Why? Because they know that he's going to stand up for them, not for you. I am going to Congress to stand up for working people in Rhode Island to stand up to the oil companies and the drug companies that are overcharging people. I don't want their money. I don't need their money. I work for you. And we are going to stand up to protect programs like Social Security and Medicare. The Republicans, they just don't ever seem to learn. They've been trying to cut those programs free. Every time they try, it blows up in their faces, but they just can't help themselves. Last week, the top Republican on the Budget Committee said that if the Republicans take control of Congress, cutting Social Security and Medicare is his top priority, and he's even willing to shut down the government in order to get what he wants. That's the party that my opponent thinks should be in charge, the ones that want to cut Social Security and Medicare. Listen, I will fight anyone from any party who wants to cut Social Security and Medicare. You paid into it. You earned it. You are entitled to it. And it's not just about cutting costs. We also need to make sure that working people get the wages and the benefits that they deserve. Here in Rhode Island, here in Rhode Island, we raise the minimum wage three times in the last 10 years, from $7 to eight, then eight to 10, 10. Now we're going from 10, 10 to 15. I supported every single one of those bills. Alan Fong opposed every single one of those bills. You know who he's fighting for. I'm sorry, Alan, you don't get to talk about caring about inflation and the cost of living when you, when you oppose raising the minimum wage from $7 to $8. How's somebody supposed to be able to live on $7 an hour in this economy? They can't. So listen, there is a difference here. The people behind me, the governor, lieutenant governor, James Diosa, Greg Amore, our congressional delegation, Joe Shikarchi, they are in this for working people. We are in this for working people. And the Republicans in Washington and the oil companies and the drug companies that are funding them, we're going to teach them a lesson this election. We're going to let them know that the people of Rhode Island can see through their tricks can see through their lies, and we are going to elect a slate of candidates that stands up for workers the way it's supposed to be. I am honored to be a part of that slate. I am going to Washington to fight for the working people of Rhode Island. Nothing is going to stop us working together. We are going to win in November and deliver real results. Thank you very much. off script here for a minute. I want to do a scientific poll. 
<laughs> Who's going to vote for Seth Magaziner? Yeah. All right, we'll send that in to the media. <laughs> Plus or minus 1%. <laughs> Before I uh, introduce uh, our next uh, speaker, I just want to acknowledge a few other people that I see from the political world. Senator Miller, old, longtime friend of the labor movement. Yeah. Our next senator from Warwick, Mark McKinney, and our next senator from East Providence, Bobby Brito. Yeah. If I missed anybody, please raise your hand. I'm doing this off the fly sometimes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> And Sandra Cano. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to bring up Brett Smiley, the mayor-elect of Providence, who uh, I feel very confident is going to do a tremendous job in our city. He has the financial understanding to do things. But more than that, he's a person of compassion and care cares about the youth of our city as evidenced by him being here and supporting these programs in the past. So with that, our mayor-elect, Brett Smiley. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to South Providence. Here in Roger Williams Park, the most vibrant neighborhood of the city of Providence in the heart of Rhode Island. We're so happy to have you here in Providence. Thank you to the Rhode Island Building Trades, particularly my friends, the Laborers Union, who, as Secretary Walsh pointed out, doesn't just care about their members, but cares about everybody in Rhode Island, which is why we're supporting big brothers and big sisters here today. It's so important that they do. You know, what big brothers and big sisters does is fills in the gaps for our children to provide mentorship and other opportunities to make sure that these young people succeed with families that have a lot going on, a lot of economic challenges, a lot of other challenges, and they're there for them. Because it takes more than just a family to raise a child successfully. It takes a whole team of people. And what we're doing here today with the rest of us is showing that this is the team that cares about the Rhode Island family. This is the team that's gonna make sure that we continue to deliver for Rhode Island families. We just heard from our next congressman from the 2nd Congressional District, Seth Magaziner. And one of the things that I'm so excited to do next year is to get to work rebuilding every school building in Providence. And how is that going to be possible? That's possible because of the work that Seth Magaziner has done as our treasurer, making sure that funding is available for schools across Rhode Island, but I intend to spend as many of those dollars in Providence as possible to make sure that families and students can send their kids to a world-class school, because that's what they deserve. That's what the kids who Big Brothers Big Sisters serves deserve. But it takes a team. It takes a team starting with the president and his cabinet, Secretary Walsh, thank you for being here. We're of course incredibly proud of his colleague on the cabinet, our governor, Gina Raimondo. It takes a team at the State House our amazing governor, who we also need to support, Governor McKee, and Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, the pride of Providence, our Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, and all the rest of the general officers, incredible partners, and Speaker Shikarchi and President Ruggiero. You, Rhode Island, we have an incredible team. The choice is very clear. The election's coming up in 17 days. Here in Rhode Island, early voting has already started. Go ahead and vote today. Don't wait until election day. Get out there and vote early. In Providence, you vote at 444 Westminster Street. If you live outside of Providence, find out where your voting place is, usually City Hall. But double check. Don't wait. The stakes are too high to risk it. Vote early, and then once you've gone vote, come and volunteer with us to help make sure everyone gets elected. Thank you for supporting the big brothers and big sisters. Thank you to the labor movement who's working so hard every day in Rhode Island to make this a better, safer, healthier place to live. Welcome to Providence. Thank you, Brett. At this time, I'm going to bring up a stranger. His name is Mike Sabatoni. Anybody know him? The only thing 
seen this happen since last year is this walk is bigger than it was last year because Mike, once he takes on a project, as you know, everybody gets involved and that's what's happened here today. It's under his leadership that the building trades in the last many years have taken on a lot of community projects, but this is the one that they have really focused on and it shows in the effort that we have here today. In the last year, Mike is also now the vice president of Leona, Labor's International Union of North America, and I think that's a recognition of the talent that he has brought to Rhode Island. So among his many titles, and he has many, and we're not going to do them all because we'll be here too long. But at this time, let's bring up my brother, our leader, Mike Sabatoni. Good morning. Thank you, George, for emceeing this morning. we got to work on that Lyuna. Lyuna. But uh, I'm just, I'm going to be very brief because I know we've got some walking to do. We've got some canvassing to do. For those of you that want to get out and canvass around the area, you see my uh, right-hand man, Scott Duhamel, from the building trades. You know, you just heard the mayor of Providence say, we can't get there alone. We are a team. So this team behind me right here, starting with the governor, our secretary of labor, our lieutenant governor, every picture you see on that truck is our home team that supports working men and women in the state of Rhode Island, that allows us to give back to causes such as Big Brothers. The labor movement is the community. We're the backbone of the community. And I just want to thank you all for being here, what you do day in and day out, to make this a better place to live. So give it up for yourselves. So labor has a, a slogan, and it is, we're all going to get there together, and we will get there together. And it doesn't happen by accident. I just want to uh, give a shout out to all my building trade brothers and sisters, everybody that's here, my executive board. I can't do what I do without the support of what I would say, no disrespect, my friend Ronnie, one of the best building trade councils in the United States. So give it up for them, too. So I've had the opportunity to know. Marty, uh, for 20 plus years, uh, to say he's a true laborer's laborer would be an understatement. And in his various capacities, as he was going through his career, causes such as this are too numerous to mention of his involvement in what he gave back to the community in Boston and now what he gives back, evident of being here today supporting candidates who support us so we can support causes like this. So, Marty, I'd like to have you come up here. And we'd like to give you a special presentation on behalf of Big Brothers Big Sisters. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Yeah. Now, in addition to that team, we have someone who's been with us for the last five years. He's one of the nicest guys you want to meet in the news media. He never says no to us. He, he has multiple causes, but he always makes it a point to be here when we ask him to come support our walk today. So I want Mike Montecavo to come up here as well for a special recognition for all you do, Mike. So with that, uh, the carousel will be open at 12, the Kona ice truck is there, the, the first 400 cups are on the building trades, after that you're on your own. Thank you for coming out, let's get out, let's make sure we get this team in place so we can keep doing what we do with causes such as this. Thank you. All right, we're uh, a, a couple of minutes from the walk. But I'd like to introduce and bring up Tina Santos, who is the Director of Marketing for Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Rhode Island. Tina? Good morning. My name is Tina Santos, and I'm the Director of Marketing at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Rhode Island. Thank you again to the Rhode Island Building and Construction Trades Council and the AFL-CIO and all the dignitaries, board members, and staff here today. For more than 50 years, we've been creating and supporting one-to-one -one mentoring relationships that ignite the power and promise of youth. The goal, inspiring, igniting, and empowering the young people that we serve. The impact continues to be great. 
We've seen Littles set and achieve goals with the encouragement of their mentors. Littles become more confident at school and in the community. Biggs invite their Littles to their wedding because it was so meaningful to have them there. Biggs and Littles try new things together like skiing, boating, art classes, and even zip lining. Also, 100% of Biggs and parents have shared with us that participation in our program has had a positive impact on them and their child. Mentoring is a lot of fun. Our bigs will tell you that, but it's also critical. Right now, young people are experiencing a mental health crisis, continued social effects from the pandemic, socioeconomic struggles, and so much more. Yet statistics show that the number one factor to building youth resiliency is a child having not five, not 10, but just one caring, consistent adult in their lives. We want to continue seeing big impacts. However, right now, we're experiencing a mentor shortage. We have nearly 60 littles waiting to be paired. More than 50 who are male mentees who would like a male mentor. We need you now more than ever. If you're interested in mentoring, you can find myself or one of our staff members over the area over there later and can answer any questions that you might have. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome one of our matches, Sandra and Shania, to tell you a little bit about their experience in this program. Sandra and Shania have been matched in our program for eight years. They actively participate in many of the activities that we offer and have seen their relationship grow through the years. Let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. also really funny. We look forward to spending time together and are grateful to have each other. We've been we've been together so long that we're like family. She even calls me sissy. <laughs> we spend time together not because we have to but because we want to. We've seen each other's best sides and been able to talk about tough stuff too. We celebrated birthdays and many milestones. It's been really it really means a lot to me. Three hours a month with them. 
it helps a child become more confident in themselves, in academic, and in the community. So the answer for me was easy. I had to do it. Why not one more adult a child can count on? If you consider mentoring, I support you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I, if you didn't know why you were here, now you do. That's why we're here. That's why we have to support this great organization. And again, uh, those are very heartfelt words. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, at this time, I uh, also like to uh, recognize Representative Alzati and Representative Morales who are here. And just as a reminder, you're going to follow the green truck for the walk and stay out of the middle of the road. I had exclamations there three times. Stay in the bike pass or the walking pass and uh, everyone gets home safe. Now, you're going to get a chance to vote again. Would anybody who's got pets that are dressed up, come on up to the front. This is the pet contest. All right. <laughs> okay. Right. Any other? Uh, any other pets? Come, come on up. We gotta get this moving. All right. I got two people to help me on this voting. Katie and Meredith are here, right? Okay. All right. Uh, Going once, going twice, going three times, that's the winner. Yeah. All right, now, are there any, are there any uh, kids that would like to come up that are dressed up in costume? Okay. Oh, oh boy, it's going to be a little tougher. All right, now. The way this is supposed to work is any other any other kids? Hanging out with like 